Bobby Kotick is gone as we move the camera. Yes, Bobby's gone, but no, Bobby's actually escaped. Bobby is invincible. Bobby will never be defeated. Bobby is just truly undefeatable. There's absolutely... I mean, he was never going to just be like booted and get out of here, Bobby. We don't want you anymore. You've ruined everything. Go to hell. It's always th this man owns the company and has for 33 years. If he's to go, it's going to go with the shiniest, most pristine golden parachute you've ever seen. You know, I, know, I know some people would rather it be gold than something else, but it's a parachute. So no, no. You know what? We've got to like go around the horseshoe. He's just he's a feature. He's a character. You know, it wouldn't be the same if, if Bobby wasn't wasn't there. Um, I don't know, there's a, there's almost this, like, uh, begrudging thing going on where, you know, we're, we don't like a lot of these things, but we're almost begrudgingly fond of Bobby. Not in a way where we're actually fond of what he's doing, but, you know, it's it's going to feel empty. What is the hunter without the hunt? <laughs> That's uh, that's why the the first the first thing I the first thought I had was yeah, I was under here and said like who who are we gonna put in thumbnails now? We're gonna need a new scapegoat. It's so over. <laughs> We're gonna need to find someone that we go. Okay, who's going to be the uh, like who, who's going to be video game evil Jesus? Sorry, Abara, you're up. <laughs> It could happen to any of us. Honestly, yeah, it feels like it's it's time for uh, it's time for someone else to get completely uh, like destroyed. It's time for it to be probably a Barra. Or maybe we'll just have to start crucifying Phil. It's like, Phil, you betrayed us. This is not getting better. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Well, that's, that's the thing. As Xbox sales decline, Phil Spencer just gets more built and dangerous looking. Yeah, I actually was surprised. He's definitely... Um, He's definitely done stuff go a little bit recently. I think all the CMA stuff's been a bit noticeable. Oh, actually, I, I I did think I was like, ah, oh, damn! I hope he gets back to his because all the all of the, the shots you see of me actually lo looks hench as hell. But he's been looking a bit worse recently. I'm like, oh, oh damn! That's that's unfortunate. No, I, I remember it was like a a picture of of Phil from like ages ago, and then I compare because you know you look up people to grab thumbnail pictures. Um, I was like old small, and then I was like, whoa, it's new new built Phil. <laughs> yeah, it, it's. It's incredible to see. It's incredible to see generally, but I think we should probably just talk about Bobby because I see people going, what's going on? Well, here's what's going on. Bobby Kotick is uh, going to no longer be in Activision Blizzard after uh, January uh, 2024. That is currently the belief. Yep, that is. Uh, obviously, things could change, but that is more or less, that is what they have said to that effect. Just, yep, and uh, he'll be gone with his big, his big, should I even say the number? Yeah, it's a... Uh 400 million dollars um which actually is just shy of a cyberpunk 2077 yeah all right sweet so what you're saying is we could get a blizzard or an activision cyberpunk 2077 almost but bobby's running away with it yeah so by the <laughs> way the 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 400 or the i think it's nearly it's closer to 500 million that's the cost of cyberpunk 2077 from start to to uh, the game coming out, to fixing the game, to Phantom Liberty. Like, Phantom Liberty itself is, like, multiple times the budgets of so many other games, like, even some AAAs, it's insane. Anyway, anyway, that's not really the point of this story. It's just to say, like, yes, fi 500 million, that's a lot. Um, yeah, so, um, I, I mean, it's not like he's just going to get a humongous wad of cash. Loads of that's going to be, um, you know, that, that's just the value. Uh, so, um, yeah, I don't know, man. It's uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, there will be no Bobby. That means who is going to run the show? That's the the big question is going to be, will someone else come in to take over Activision from an outside perspective? Or will this be a case of someone who's already there gets promoted up a little bit and then they kind of fill roles from within? And that's kind of the hard part to guess because Activision is such a huge, like, they're, they're run like such a, I guess a, a standard corporation as opposed to specifically game stuff that it seems like it's probably going to be more out of the standard playbook, which is we will throw a very, very big amount of money at someone from the corporate world to come and join. That would be my first instinct, but Xbox might not run like that because they're the ones now in effect in charge. So that'll be the interesting part of like how much of, how much of, Act how much of whoever runs Activision after this, how much of this will be, Xbox saying, we're going to insert someone who does what we want. We're going to get someone from, you know, just someone transplanted over to move Activision in that way. Or are they going to go a little bit closer to the, hey, Activision, you were fine as you were, which no one actually agrees with, I think, um, especially no one watching this. But then, you know, do you want to continue and operate the way you have and have some decent freedom? Or is it going to be, you're now a wing of Xbox 
because it could be either. And I know it's it's like largely been framed as separate ish and helping mm. each other like a mutually beneficial agreement. But generally speaking, it's going to be a little closer to, um, or it could be either way. Basically, I, I think it'll be a slow change just because um, there are so many moving parts. Um, I mean, God, you look at Call of Duty and it's insane. Those Call of Duty seasons are fast. And the amount of content they have is mad. Now, of course, I don't mean video game playing content, obviously, uh, because we all know the real content of video games now is the various optional cosmetics you can attain. And, oh my god, you know, we're, I think we'll talk about it later. Um, I think we got that topic coming up later, but, um, you know, if you want to be, uh, to be um, Lilith in Call of Duty, you, you can do that. If you want to buy the... Um, this is very targeted to me. I could have a cat girl weapon skin while running around as um, as a paranormal investigator. That's just the sort of thing that happens in COD now. I the, hate Fortnite. Yes. Fortnite started all this. And that is kind of coming to other Blizzard things. Um, now that said, Blizzard crossover is something people have kind of wanted them to do, or maybe we, we've been surprised they haven't done that much crossover, given the IPs that they have. And, you know, it's there, it's on Battle.net, it's all under their control. But anyway, I, uh, with those major projects, I think just have so many things going on that, um, you know, there'll be no coming in, gutting stuff, changing projects. Well, changing projects that we've heard about. There is obviously the unannounced survival game. When will it be announced? Will it ever be? Hang on, they've called it the unannounced survival game. Do you think they're going to unannounce it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's... Because uh, then, then, then its name would be accurate. We're like, hello, everybody. We are shipping unannounced survival game. It's now unannounced. Continue on. <laughs> we have, <laughs> yeah, we, we never announced it, so you can't be mad. <laughs> yeah, they in fact... They, in fact, announced that they were going to unannounce it years in advance. It was really nice of them. It's, it's finally... never yeah. expected. Yeah, finally some self-awareness in the game industry. <laughs> uh, what is it that's likely to be cancelled? It's like X-Defiant looks like it's likely to be cancelled because he postponed a load of beta tests and everyone's going, oh no! Wait, what? Yeah, and I saw a lot of people talk about it being... I think that's a multiplayer shooter from Ubisoft. Mm. That was, like, in development for a long time and uh, beta tests are showing up, like, pretty, like, positively. And we'll get off, like, the general industry topics and talk a little bit more about what this means for Blizzard soon enough. But it is, like, it's kind of crazy that Blizzard, like, seem to have never learned anything from any of their mistakes. At least as far as, like, if this unannounced survival game goes the way that I think the rest of the industry seems to be going with, here's a big project we're going to bomb ahead with. Then you're just looking at, like, an Overwatch again, but maybe not with the drastic, like, saving throw that mm. ultimately happened to Overwatch. And it just, it, it's weird with the unannounced survival games. It's like, man, there's fucking indie teams of, you know, small amounts of people um, running 60% uh, mixed review um, survival game early access titles on um, on Steam successfully for years. Wow. <laughs> What's stopping you? Um, yeah. So, I suppose the one thing people would think about, though, is um, will Microsoft ownership impact the games, the IPs that we care about? That's where stuff gets interesting. Um, I mean, the idea of... This is this is certainly a weird one, but say your World of Warcraft subscription and Game Pass Ultimate. Would they do that? Because on the one hand, you could see them wanting to do that. On the other hand, you'd be like, um, you really throw that amount of money you're earning away? But on the other, other hand, they declined to sell Star... Oh, Stargate, no. They declined to sell Starfield on PlayStation. And uh, PlayStation has a significantly larger install base on current-gen consoles than uh, than Xbox does. So they are clearly willing to sacrifice a large payday right now to, uh, I suppose, grow what they see as their true KPI, which, I mean, hey, it's a growth-based tech story rather than a, you know, super-optimized uh, sort of cash flow uh, story, which I suppose is more the Activision story. Yeah, and it's weird because both are kind of... Neither are inherently bad. It's just that you look at the Activision version, you go, oh, what's your optimized cash flow? Never making anything fun. Cool. And then the Microsoft version is, oh, well, you're, you're throwing money like he like hand over fist into this like ecosystem of video games and none of them are ever coming out. What? Can we not have something in the middle? No, nah, bro. Where you put some Rainbow. money in and Rainbow. get some money out? Why does it have to be 
nothing in extracting juice until dry or let's just keep funneling money into the hole eventually the hole will be full Yo, well, that's, we hope no that's the crazy thing about ea have you noticed that ea have just been putting out games yeah isn't that crazy it's like capcom as well you go EA well, <laughs> games imagine they're not called ea services yeah and do you know what's even more freaking crazy um, you know, Battlefield 2042, it was the laughing stock for such a long time. Um, one of the boys, I think it was, I think it was Connor put the screenshot in chat. 54,000 is concurrent players right now. It's got like a free weekend and also the new like patch dropped, but like they've basically rehabbed 2042. And then you've got, you know, the Star Wars Jedi games, they're just making games and they're coming out. Seems and then the game for comes them, yeah. out and I buy the game. I'm like, oh, look, I bought the game. Bought the game, you and get I suppose play that, that's the weird thing. It's like, you know, with your Baldur's Gates, and there's been all these just games coming out. You, you play them, you're really happy. And then I suppose uh, in contrast to that, the big live services kind of look like clown shows. Baldur's Gate's a very interesting one. Because oh, I, was, yeah. I was like, I was basically reminded of that today in a completely different context. But it was it Baldur's Gate 3 is an example of someone showing up and going, hello, you see the thing that the industry says is completely, utterly impossible? Well, if you put enough like work and sense in you can just do it you can literally just make a good product at a reasonable budget and obviously go well that's well does the exception prove the rule etc 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 and you go well they've literally went you can just ha make it happen obviously there's early but access stuff it, but what it feels like with Baldur's gate is you know all the suits right you know the, the suits are doing their suit things and then like the fucking scrawny kid that they last saw eight years ago has spent eight years hard bulking and just walks into the room and is undefeatable. That's kind of what's happened with Baldur's Gate. You know, they just they were just sitting there doing exactly their thing. Yeah, there's like, th this is going to sound completely insane. And I know we, like, we often talk in the firm terms of business here because that's kind of the, the analysis we do is on that front. But it's like everyone in the games industry is all, and this is the problem with the Activision, how Activision have not really shit in ages and why we get things like Vicarious Visions going over to do Diablo 2 or D2R instead of Tony Hawk's 3. But it's like they're, <laughs> they're, they're very good at going, well, how do we business business this? How do we business magic this? How do we use our business strategy and all that stuff? How do we like move this money around and et cetera? And then there's just someone going, have you considered putting that any of that effort into making games? Into, <laughs> into the art and craft of game development? And obviously you say, well, you know, of course there's going to be, the devs are going to be handling that. But the thing is, if, the, if, the, if at the top, the organizational structure is focused on we will do the business, you do the, we'll do the strategy, you do the tactics. It's like, you want to strategize around having good tactics. Ah, you ah. don't want, you don't want to just go, ah, do whatever. Ah, ah, no, 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 no. There you go. <laughs> no. <laughs> Fantastic um, analysis. No, I, it's, um, I see it comes to the opportunity cost thing. Yeah. The, the people, the, the big, and do you know what, it, do you know what it's about? It's about like perspectives. Because you know the way, um, like, imagine if you spoke French and you thought in French versus, like, you now thinking in English or whatever language you speak. You know, it's pretty different. It's, you know, it's one of the things um, that you sort of hear people talk about with, um, you know, people who can speak in multiple languages to a really good degree of fluency to the point where they can kind of, like, you know, think in those other languages. Um Stuff like, you know, reading from left to right is normal for us, not normal to some other people. You know, all of these, like, truly, you, you know, a different reality. And I feel like if you're a game director and everything, you know, your every day is about how do we get production? How do we, you know, design, blah, 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 blah. To the person in, you know, in business land, they don't see any of the, like, grit. You know, they, they they just see, you know, buy land, process happens, then there's an apartment building on yeah. the land, and then I sell it. Pure, you know, pure black box of, yeah, of, yeah. of money and money. Out. So they get to see the other, you know, revenue generating instruments that are going around and, you know, from all the different companies. So that's going to inform the, their informational reality and the, the decisions that they make. Um, and I suppose that's why they'll say, why are we building... You know, why, why are we building the... I, okay, I am officially ending the property analogy because I cannot carry it any further. Fantastic. But they're just going to be like, why are you building Warcraft 4? Or Because like as a Warcraft fan, imagine if there was a Warcraft 4 and it had three expansions in the same way, or, you know, two expansions. Like in the same way that you got Starcraft 2, Heart of the Swarm, 
Wings of Liberty. You know, you got or uh, Legacy of the Voice. You know, you got all those big campaigns and your co-op commanders mode and it's just, everything's, you know, good and happy. And everybody knows StarCraft's never going to generate a billion dollars. But it is going to be a happy little business. Uh, that's, you know, that's doing good. Like, to the person who... Uh, you know, as I said, is living in that entirely different informational environment, they are just going to say, okay, so this black box of developers, you're going to cost the same amount of money, but you're telling me you're going to take a lower risk bet on something that really isn't going to move the needle that much compared to like this other thing that we're doing called Call of Duty. Look what it does to the needle. Even if you do really well, the needle will go, uh, and I won't notice. And I think that's like so much, um, and this is just speculation and I don't know your, your fucking your like sixth sense that you get when you've been watching an industry for such a long time and you kind of, you know, you almost force yourself to understand, say Zenimax, when they did uh, Wolfenstein, like the whole Wolfenstein Youngblood thing. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, made for a good skill up review. Uh, um, also ruined one of the better series of shooters that was ha- happening at a time. And is that not the perfect example of, like, the person making the big decision didn't get it? And that's what led to Arcane, uh, Arcane Austin, specialists in games like Prey, which was awesome, Prey Moon Crash, which was really awesome, making Redfall. Didn't work! And uh, so, I, uh, yeah. And so, like... Through the years, I've talked to people from uh, from Blizzard, like n- not a humongous amount of people. Um, it, I don't know what year. Maybe it was 20, 2019? It was in this office. Actually, I was sitting in this very seat, so it was whenever this existed, but I don't think we were doing our stream yet. I think it was before the stream when we used this as a meeting room. That's a long time ago. Yeah, a long ass time ago. Um, but that person was a fairly senior role on... Uh, on... Um, yeah, on Hots. Yeah, I think that's okay. Rest in peace, Hots. Yes, that, that individual was a fairly, you know, definitely high up enough the totem pole to, like, no shit. And uh, that person's opinion was, all the shit you read about Activision is goddamn true. They will not greenlight anything that doesn't have turbo big potential. Um, and I guess when I look at Microsoft, they do seem to have a rather interesting strategy. So... Sony's growth strategy is all about humongous tent poles. Whereas with Microsoft, um, I feel like Microsoft are a bit more okay with a larger number of tent poles that like aren't as big. Just when I think about the uh, the kind of resources put into Flight Sim, not to discount Flight Sim players as being a tiny niche or anything, because um, I know the revenue per user in the flight sim space will definitely be a lot um, higher, you know, like with the train, train sim games and some of the other uh, things in the sim genre. Um, Age of Empires, you know, like AoE 2 Definitive Edition, AoE 4, that's all trucking on pretty good. They didn't need to do it that right. I suppose you then... Someone, I love that. I love then, that then someone, so much. Then someone walks in and is like, hey, what about Halo Infinite then? And I think that's just 343 Industries being a holdover from the same era of Microsoft that, get ready for a bit of Matt Soul to die, was responsible for Scalebound. Yeah, let's go! I can't wait for Cami to go get in his Lamborghini drive off, wait his one year non-compete, try Soulbound, or Scalebound again, and it'll be shit. Oh anyway. yeah, yes. Kami announced his departure um, uh, with a picture of him getting into his Lambo, pretty much saying he was going to go and be a YouTuber. No, he said he was going. He said he was going to the job center, but oh, it's a joke. Okay. It's a joke because they have a year long uh, non compete yeah. with Shinji Mikami as well. But um, yeah, th- there's something about that where that's why I'm happy about Microsoft. Uh, like actually, here because no, I'm not sure their long term strategy will pan out. I'm not sure if this throw money into the void, this will eventually work, will actually manifest. But for at least a reasonable time being, their strategy has been, like as far as Game Pass value is concerned, it's been fantastic. Being a Game Pass subscriber is amazing. Like having Lies of P just th- there to play, oh, funded shit, by them, yeah. that's an incredible game. So the more they can do that, like I, what I played uh, Ori, like the two Ori games recently, and they're amazing and I played them for, and it's all on Game Pass. So to... Uh, for them to like show up and maybe influence a little bit of Blizzard in the sense that you're saying they're happy to make more tempo releases, they're not going to go, we need this thing to make infinite money or we're dead. They're going to go, what if we have lots of things that people quite like that make us money? 
And obviously Blizzard have been kind of chasing a World of Warcraft since World of Warcraft. So I think... Hello, it, Project Titan. Yeah, so... Hello, I, unannounced survival game. <laughs> exactly. So obviously, like, there's stuff like Here's the Storm, which was maybe, a, like, a, a throw at that. Hearthstone was maybe a throw at that as well. It came from, like, a smaller uh, version at the same time. But I think there's a little... Um, there's a bit of hope there just for that culture to bleed in and go, hey, we would like to make a video game that is, you know, Warcraft 4 or... <laughs> <laughs> or we'd like another try at StarCraft Ghost, maybe. <laughs> Lame games for nerds. Exactly. No, no, you want to be Goku and Call of Duty. See, that's that's what that's the thing, right? And this is funny because I've I only skim read it, but uh, Lulu Messervy is that how to pronounce her name? She's the COO EVP at Activision. Yeah, Blizzard. fucking Lulu, fucking based god of twitter yeah she's she's <laughs> she's a nuckiest in the best way but uh i know people don't like her for very good reasons but i was reading some of like the stuff she writes on her blog earlier today because i was procrastinating very hard and she was, was talking about like you're um, performing deep research exactly yeah. and she there was a quote from someone she wrote about where it's like the riches well the riches are in the niches or i say niche yeah but like the rich the riches are in, in the niches today as far as like things go i'm like the mega billions are not the mega billions are in everyone is under your umbrella. Yeah, like but, if, if Lulu could have convinced her boss to follow that, that would have been great. Because now the riches are in the niches. What that means is, do you like a cheeky fap over a cat girl? Well, in that case, you can put one in your gun in Call of Duty. Do you like Diablo? Well, here's the Diablo bundle in Call of Duty. Do you... Oh, have... Have you seen people wear those Dragon Ball Z shirts? You don't really know what it is, but hey, people kind of like it for some reason, so you want to feel like you're in on it? Well, here's that niche. So the riches are in the niches. That would have felt like, oh, here's, you know, great things for everyone. Wonderful. Now it's just kind of like, here's a bundle in the Mono Billions game that, um, you know, that has slurped up some culture. you like, oh, do you like John Wick? He's in Fortnite now. That's certainly a problem. <laughs> but I feel like, and this might just be pure copium, but I feel like there's definitely a contraction of the industry's sizes involved. And even with people like Sean Layden, who used to be, I can't remember what his job was, but he was very, very important to PlayStation yeah. for green lighting games and all that stuff. And he said to the effect recently, because he's free and doesn't have to like mind what he says on Twitter anymore, he was just like, no, this game development needs to shrink in size. This is completely unsustainable. Has been for years. It's getting completely out of control. And he said that largely in response to what happened with uh, Sony's recent stuff with Jim Ryan leaving and everyone going, oh yeah, Jim Ryan's big live service everything strategy. That looks like it's been a profound failure internally. And Bungie run around going, Oh, you brought you you bought us so we could look at your live service games and say if they're good and they're all shit. Are like cool. So what do you do? You go back to that temple. You go back to that. Here's a god of war. You actually like that? Obviously, that's a like a massive game in and of itself. But you kind of go, well, what happens? If, what happens in a world where you do what EA are yeah. doing? What happens in a world where you go? Why are we not doing what Capcom are doing? And then you take five years to hire developers make your own internal engine that's actually good unlike anything else it's like but instead of starting instead of trying to increase your sales by doing new coke make another drink people will like yeah more or less <laughs> actually, yeah yeah baron thanks for the correction he said that in response to capcom ceo comments about how costly game development is mm. because capcom ceo said the price needs to go up soon for their games because they kept them at 60 dollars Oh, yeah. So it is like, uh, kind of got my wires crossed, but, but they all lead into the same thing of this development expense, like, being massive. And that's what that's what's, like, hampered Blizzard specifically, and that's why I'm talking about it. So uh, this is where some things get interesting. Yeah. Um, I saw, was it Daniel Ahmad posted it? I don't know, but I'm sure he probably has because I think it's up his alley. Yeah, they posted um, it or reposted it with a funny joke. There you go. One of the two. Um, it was the amount of venture capital funding going into games. I think it was per quarter or whatever, but whatever the number was, it went from like 2.1 billion at the recent uh, height in like 2021. Um, and it pretty much went down to like 700 million. It was like either a 30, uh, it was a decrease to 30% or 40% off its previous value, just plummeted. And um, I can't really do the who's or the what's, but um, I have heard of some of the burn rates of some game startups in Cali, and they are absolutely goddamn insane. Absolutely mad. 
Uh, and it's kind of weird because like right now you hear people talking about jobs and uh, you see actually people kind of struggling with jobs in games because there is this broader market correction downwards. Um, yet I remember like a few years ago, um, you know, people being like, oh, darn, you know, that <laughs> I can only offer 150 grand. I cannot compete with Riot. They're going to give 350 grand to someone. Mm -hmm. um, and now it seems like the tone of that's really, uh, yeah, has really changed. And I guess it's like, how much of that was chasing some sort of fake growth dream? Yeah, because I, I want to say most of it. Yeah, I want to say most if, of it. If that's chasing a fake growth dream, but there's a reality of sustainably making games that make their budget back plus a lot of profit and everyone's happy, you would hope like a Jedi survivor. You would hope like an Alan Wake too. You would hope like Control. You would hope like Senua. Uh, you know, games of that caliber. You would hope like Lies of P. Yeah, there's a, there is certainly a uh, an issue with some of that profit, profit stuff. And this is where we get into how big the industry is versus how many people are in it and how much people, how much, you know, it's the, the thing where the, the riches are in those niches. And it's like, yeah, they're riches for within a niche. They're not infinite billion dollars. They're not your your mega billions that you like you want. You just sat there going, okay, well, well, you have to adjust expectations down and price down to make actual sense. You can't just go, well, we can grow forever. We can we can just say the numbers will make sense and the numbers will. And I think that's large like a lot of the problem as far as it's concerned. So I know like there's uh, was it Lamplighters League there that game, oh, and yeah. I'm just like, yeah, no one wanted this and it sucked and or it wasn't even like was it, it, it reviewed it okayish. I was like, no one wanted this. Why did we make it a shit I guess we're done for now? Well, that's, yeah, it's, you know what's weird with Lamplighters League? To me, that feels, I don't want to say it feels like an Ubisoft game, and I'm not trying to be, like, overly, you know, mean, but it, it, it kind of feels like we put a genre, we, you know, we mix the theme with a the genre more so than this full idea, came, you know, this full creative vision came to us. Um, I don't know how, because I also don't want to like undersell what the developers have done. I mean, look at it in Steam, you know, the game is sitting at 72%, uh, which is like, it's not terrible. Uh, it's not amazing, but there's lots of quality there. There's lots of craft there still. Um, but yeah, not enough money. Boomerang X, that was another example. Boomerang X, fucking crazy looking cool indie game. Um, and uh, I want to do a video on that because I imagine their revenue is similar to our revenue for Pale Beyond. Um, and the reason why I say that is they have 800 and something Steam reviews. We have just over a thousand. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think we're at similar price points. So if the sort of ratios of Steam reviews to sales kind of hold true, then I'd like kind of roughly know where they are. Um, I mean, we got that in a period of, you know, like, like six months, whereas that game has been out for like two years. Um, but like, you know, we did our game with the publisher. They did their game with Devolver. I don't know what Devolver's terms are like. Um, but like, that's another example of like, yeah, <laughs> really good game. Numbers. The number didn't go up enough. <laughs> yeah. There's like, we could literally talk about this for a billion hours, about the size of the market, how much of it is, con is constricted in the big places. How much of the, there's a billion, there's $500 billion in video games. And they're like, oh, yeah, but $499 billion of that is wrapped up in Call of Duty and FIFA revenue actually. Um, or I, well, I should say, you know, and uh, Genshin Impact Revenue and Honk Star Rail. Uh, I've heard of Roger left. Corman. Uh, no. Oh, B-movie B Roger Corman. You're mad, like James Cameron, I think, is one of his protégés. Loads of people are. Mm. Roger Corman is just one of those people uh, who did, um, like, basically movies. Oh, my God, he's still going. He's 97. Huh. He did loads of movies that were so cheap. He was the cheapest bastard on the planet. If you wanted to like get whatever movie, you know, he would he would be able to do it. You know, Star Wars comes out. Basically, you know like um best of the worst. Like the upper echelon of quality of movies you would see in a best of the worst episode, that's like Roger Corman. But his whole thing was we're going to do these, we're going to really clamp our costs down. We'll try our best and that'll be that. Um, and it's it's why he's kind of not really known much outside of like film, but within film, he was so prolific, produced so many movies, and so many eventually very famous people kind of crossed paths with him at some stage that he was like super known. 
Um, not that I'm saying we should uh, apply a Blumhouse or like the Asylum like business model, but even actually look at Blumhouse. Uh, Blumhouse are the horror movie uh, people, and uh, you know th- they've released a lot of trash, right? Um, but they've also released um, like Hereditary. I think was it was it Hereditary? Um, Us that was them. Uh, Split was them. Get Out was them, um, and also loads of trash. Um, but their whole thing is, I, I guess, like we will do these in a cost-controlled way, and we will do our best within that cost. And um, you know, it seems it seems to lead to a sustainable business. And I think that's what that's what we're going to eventually contract into with all these live services. That's the whole thing of like, like World of Warcraft will only ever be as big again, and it needs to actually find where that makes sense for it. I think in terms of how, like, what Microsoft are going to do when they come in and look at it, what's, what's going to happen, like, I guess in the, in the, in the near to far future, there has to be a, no, well, the, the money well has dried up because we're no longer in an era of people can just invent money out of nowhere and VCs are walking around going, what's that? Do you have a vague idea that might be one of the, like the unicorns? There you go, work away. Yeah, have all you like, want. When VCs are existing in a world where money is free, like that that was the thing. Interest rates were basically zero. Um, we were, interest rates were basically zero. We were in the middle of one of the largest bull runs in history, I think. Like the levels of number go up. You see the amount of people, uh, the coronavirus market dip, taught a lot of people a very, very important lesson. And that is the market can stay uh, insane longer than you can stay solvent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's so much There's so much to that about just free money drying up and everyone goes, oh, well, where's all the free money gone? Whoops. Shit, we should yeah. probably have planned for this. That's and that's like an things. era that's ending that people are really feeling. People with a mortgage on a flexible rate will have undoubtedly, uh, you know, if you're in your flexible rate period, will undoubtedly have felt that within like the last year or two. Um, good example, like that's something that I have felt in um, trying to work out and secure like funding for, uh, you know, for the future. It, it does kind of change the arithmetic. It, yeah. I mean, it just, that's it. It just changes that shit. Yeah. So um, you've got really a lot of VCs seemingly not putting more money in. Yeah, um, the money money literally is now different than it was a couple of years ago. That's how it works in like in every capacity. Everyone's going to feel that. Oh, it's great. We but can do all, a channel called Better Money in every title, every thumbnail. Just this changes everything. Yeah, it's Perfect. it's just different now. And obviously you can experience that in your own life, but that's what it's going to, it's going to experience, like that's going to happen in business everywhere. You're going to see that everywhere you go. There's going to be, everything is downstream of the big money machine because everything is literally connected to one big beating heart of money move. <laughs> like that's it. Everything is downstream of that. So you go and you're like, well, where's all the new products? And it's, sorry, companies don't feel comfortable to invest on new products anymore. That's going to be a thing of, oh, well, we're, where, where's my product gone? Like even to, more expensive, to, et cetera, et cetera. To give people an example um, of this, and like it does impact the market, you know, it impacts all the games companies. Look at Epic Games. People are like, oh, it's Epic Games, Fortnite money, 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 literally, now, money, money. Literally infinite money. Yeah, Printing literally all infinite day long. money. Also, privately held company. Um, yes, Tencent or whoever it is that own a, a part it's of them. Tencent like, about 40%, but... Yeah, the rest is Tim goddamn Sweeney and Tim 60 is a bit bigger than their 40 so even with that, they had to lay off sixteen percent. Yeah, that's um, so such such an obscene amount. Of the games industry lay- layoffs everywhere. And as an example, over right, six thousand so this year, I think I read. Take Boomerang X. I think that was a situation where they couldn't find a publisher for their new game, and you're gone. And for publishers, money's expensive now. You know, like um, I've had talks with publishers in the last uh, like three months. Um, I suppose I could probably say it. Um, Ah, wait, no, could I say it? Because it could sort of tie back. I mean, nothing. Yeah, I don't get anyone in trouble. They don't even work there anymore. But, like, the market conditions, like, were brought up in that talk. It was a bit of a Isla Mouse. So the last time we talked, this has happened. Um, (laughs) Yeah, money works differently than the last time we talked, so the material reality has changed. Yeah, and that group have significantly laid staff off since. Yeah. Um, You know, there's people, uh, people I know, who um, are 
um, you know, like we're working with publishers. I mean, even like the Team 17 story, I know people who are published with Team 17, you know, they've had their 50 QA staff gone. Um, it's like, it's everywhere. It's everywhere, this pullback. It's kind of crazy. Yep. And that's where I think, because um, I think we've maybe, we've maybe gone a little bit, a little bit long on this specific topic. <laughs> so we should maybe talk a little bit about something uh, more close to, more close to home for this. But like that ultimately leads into what are Microsoft going to do? What are Blizzard going to do? What's Activision going to do? How is that going to make any sense in like the, in the, in the future? And it's just, yeah, we're going to see them maybe learn their lesson and maybe go, okay, what if we make games that are more reasonable and more guaranteed to be profitable and more guaranteed to be like like small and nimble how do we get more shots at being reasonable as opposed to these monolithic high risk nightmares because as risk goes up because money is no longer free then you're going to see the like them go okay we can't make massive bets obviously there'll be so, some companies still go we'll make massive bets because we're the c-suite and if our massive bet goes wrong we get rid of all of our employees and we're fine yeah, Which, yeah. <laughs> we don't have to actually deliver the bet that we've made um, yeah. Even thinking about my own my own arithmetic, because obviously with Pale Beyond coming out, we then had to do the whole, huh, what what now? Um Yeah, you know, we had to do the, the the what now and we we didn't cancel a project, but we did change projects uh away from the larger thing into a more achievable thing. And it's like fundamentally I would rather I would rather release something smaller and achievable maybe like every 18 months, instead of take a really big bet uh, that takes three years to find out if it's a good bet or not. And, uh, you know, boom. If it doesn't work out, you're dead. Versus a case where it's like, you know, say we do Pale Beyond. Say we do like next game, next game. Does fine, doesn't make as much money back. Um, That's fine. Because if we're going cost controlled and reasonable and we're trying to be sustainable, then you haven't batted the whole, what was it people say, bat the farm? Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. 